Welcome to our Bible class this week. In the passage that's before us, it's one of the most helpful, hopeful, encouraging, promising, comforting passages in all of the Bibles for followers of Jesus. It pictures a series of events which will turn tragedy to triumph, poverty to riches, pain to glory, defeat to victory. It's the high point, or maybe we could call it the high watermark, of the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. As we begin, as always, let's do so in prayer, seeking God's wisdom, seeking his insight that would be ours through his spirit as we study today. Lord, as we consider the dramatic scene portrayed in these verses, give us boldness to proclaim it and comfort to encourage it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we launch into these final verses of 1 Thessalonians 4, welcome again to our Bible class at Calvary Bible Fellowship Church in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. I'm Dick Regal, and I help teach out, teach here at Calvary. It's glad to, glad to have each of you with us. We're studying the Apostle Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians, some of Paul's earliest writings. And because of persecution, by unbelieving Jews in this northern Greek city in the first century, Paul was unable to spend much time there to teach these young believers in their faith. So a few months after having to escape literally with his life under the cover of darkness, according to verse 10 of Acts 17, Paul pens these letters to further instruct the followers of Jesus in their faith, verse 2 of chapter 3, to charge them to walk or to live in a manner worthy of God, verse 12 of chapter 2, to challenge them to holiness, which we saw last time in chapter 4, and this time to correct any misunderstandings or misconceptions regarding the return of Christ to earth. Because their times were so uncertain in that first century and are so unprecedented in our 21st century, we need to hear Paul's reassuring words, his word from the Lord, verse 15 of chapter 4, which we'll get into in a moment regarding what we might call one of the non-negotiables of our Christian faith, the return of Christ to this earth. There are what I consider five non-negotiables to our Christian faith, our followers of Christ, and I'll list them out for you, though Paul makes reference to only one of them here. But there are really five things which we cannot negotiate on in our understanding. The first one is the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Let me list them out, and then I'll just go back briefly and, and uh, highlight them for you. The verbal inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the second coming of Christ. Five non-negotiables, five fundamentals of our faith, which we must always adhere to. The verbal inspiration of the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16. That speaks to the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is fully God and fully man. Isaiah 7, 14 in the Old Testament, John 1, 17 in the New Testament. Thirdly, the substitutionary death of Christ, his atonement for sin on the cross, Colossians 1, 14. The resurrection of Christ, the physical, literal, literal bodily resurrection of Christ from the death, John 20, verse 27. In fact, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, testify to that. And then the second coming of Christ, his physical, literal return of Christ to earth. Titus 2.13, and then these verses from 1 Thessalonians 4. So those far five distinctives, those five non-negotiables, the verbal inspiration of the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16, the deity of Christ, Isaiah 7.14, John 1.17, the substitutionary death of Christ, his atonement for our sin on the cross, Colossians 1.14, the resurrection of Christ, he bodily raised from the dead, John 20.27, 20, just one reference. And for our purposes today in this session, the second coming of Christ, his physical, literal return to earth, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 17. So those are five non-negotiables of the Christian faith. And Paul speaks to one of them, the last one, the return of Christ to earth, in these verses. And even though this passage is comprised of a mere six verses, 
to do justice to it in 30 minutes is next to impossible. Innumerable books and sermons, articles, blogs, you name it, have been written, given, preached on it. Why? Because it's the hope to which every follower of Jesus clings, especially in times like these. Nonetheless, we'll try to tackle in the next few moments this most dramatic event, what Bible students refer to as the rapture of the church. And why it's called that, we'll get to that in a few moments. But the verses, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and I invite you to follow along if you have a Bible in front of you or if you have it on one of your devices. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. <clears throat> but we do not want to, you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, Paul's euphemism, as we'll see for death, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another or encourage each other with these words. These verses, inspired of the Holy Spirit, provide for every generation of Christians a balanced perspective to the coming of Christ. People look at the coming of Christ oftentimes in an unbalanced way. They're either obsessed with it or they ignore it. But these verses give us a balanced perspective to it. He's coming, is what Paul is saying. Jesus is coming. And the realization of that truth should be an incentive to progressing daily in holiness. And that's a carryover from Paul's emphasis on holiness and sanctification in the initial verses of this first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. But Paul's not the only one to make that emphasis. Second Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter describes the coming of the day of the Lord, which Paul discusses in 1 Thessalonians 5, which we'll see next time. And then again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he discusses that holiness and purity should describe the follower of Jesus in days of heresy and hardship. And that's not an unfamiliar theme in the New Testament. And it is a theme that we need to teach and preach today as well. We've talked about persecution as we have looked through 1 Thessalonians, and it will surface again in 2 Thessalonians. And I said a few weeks ago that I would share with you a progression of persecution. What, what I see has occurred over the last 25 years in this country, and I'll do that as we get into 2 Thessalonians. But if 1 Thessalonians like a behavior manual for uncertain or unprecedented times, 1 and 2 Peter are like a survival manual for end times. Survival manual for end times. Now people are asking today, is the virus crisis that we're all engulfed in, is it a signal that we're living in the end times? Well, the end times really are described in Revelation chapter 6 and through 6 through 19. And if you read through those chapters, as we studied this past winter in the book of Revelation here at Calvary Church, we'll find that, that in that description, we're not living in the end times as such because those chapters describe events that, as bad as this virus crisis is, it will pale in comparison to what's described in those chapters. However, we are living in the last days. Now, what's the difference? Well, the end times describe those years just prior to the second coming of Christ to this earth to establish his kingdom. The last days began with the formation of the church, with the resurrection of Christ, they will continue till the return of Christ, as Paul describes here in this passage of 1 Thessalonians 4. So we're living right now in the last days, not necessarily in the end times. Though, really, this crisis that we're facing is precedent-setting. 
things are occurring that we could see would would lead to some of the things that are described in Revelation. And I've been jotting some of those down, and I've come up with a number of ways, and maybe we'll have opportunities as we get into Second Thessalonians to just to uh, rehearse those for you. But there's a lot to cover here in First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, so we'll reserve some of those things for some upcoming sessions. So hope that you can stay with us. The last words of verse 13 of First Thessalonians 4 often have been used as a title to the book of First Thessalonians, that of hope. Hope. Paul offers hope for a hopeless world. And that's certainly descriptive of our world today. But we can live with confidence because of our conviction about the events that will climax history. So we need not live without hope today. Instead, we can live with conviction. And only that kind of hope will sustain us. Only that kind of hope will settle our fears or calm our anxieties in these troublesome times. And you don't need to be told, no one needs to be told, that people's fears are unsettled today, that our anxieties certainly are not calming. And so the kind of hope that Paul issues forth here will help us to deal with those. Now there's a sequence of five events that will occur as Christ returns for his church as found in these verses. And they're spelled out for you on the, the lesson notes that you can log on to and print off if you'd like to follow along. Five events that will occur as Christ returns for his church as Paul describes it here. Christ will return. He will return visibly with a commanding shout. And all five of these are found in verse 16. He will return with a commanding shout. There will be an unmistakable call from an archangel. There will be a trumpet fanfare such as never been heard. Believers in Christ who've died will rise from their graves. And believers living will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those five sequence of events will occur, Paul states, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit as Christ returns for his church. And commanding shout, unmistakable call from the archangel, from an archangel, trumpet fanfare, Believers in Christ who have died will rise from their graves. Believers living will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Won't that be a moment in time? Won't that be a moment in time? While the followers of Jesus may differ on the timing of this event, what's called the rapture of the church, whether it's prior to the tribulation as it's graphically described in Revelation chapter 6 through 19 to which we've already referred, or whether it's in the middle of it or at the end of it as Christ returns to establish his millennial kingdom in chapter 19 of Revelation, while we may differ on the timing of those, all believers agree that it will happen. It will happen <clears throat> as reported by two angels at the ascension of Jesus, in Acts 1 and verse 11. Jesus, who was taken up from you, the angel said to his disciples, in heaven will come in the same way, the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so while we may disagree on the timing of these events as such, we do not disagree on the fact that they will occur. And as Jesus ascended into heaven, Acts 1 11, he will descend from heaven in that same manner as Paul describes it in these verses. You see, it was not Paul's intention to provide a timeline for this event. He was, it was not his intention to provide how all end time events would coalesce, how they would all come together. Instead, he desired to reassure these Thessalonian believers and all followers of Jesus, including us, that fellow believers who had died would not miss out on Christ's return and his eternal kingdom. And so that, that's the essence of this passage. It's not the timing of the event that's that significant, but the fact that it will occur and that Paul shares this word that he received from Jesus to reassure the Thessalonians and to reassure all of us that those who die in Christ, followers of Christ who die today, 
would not miss out on Christ's return or his eternal kingdom. It's only the living word, Jesus Christ, who can infuse that hope and that assurance and that confidence. And it's only the written word, the Bible, that can accurately instruct us in the knowledge of his return that will enable hope to burn brightly in our hearts in anticipation of this spectacular event. The only reliable resource on the return of Christ is the living word, Christ, and the written word, the scriptures. Therefore, these verses, again, 13 to 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, is a message of comfort, of consolation, of confidence, to which we can grasp by faith in our turbulent phase of history. Some Thessalonians were thinking, as do some today, that if Christ is coming soon, if he could come at any moment, and we read in scripture that that the coming of Christ is at hand, shouldn't we just quit work? If we're working, shouldn't we just quit? If we're not working, why go back to work if he's coming so soon? Sell our homes and climb the nearest mountain? So we'll be ready and closer to when he comes. We have mountains here in eastern Pennsylvania. We could climb to the highest mountain and maybe we get the jump on it when he returns. Shouldn't we be doing that? Well, the passage that we have in front of us is a clear word from the Lord. Verse 15, Paul states that we declare to you by a word from the Lord. And how Paul received that word, we're not certain, a special revelation to Paul, or perhaps the teaching of Jesus passed along orally. Some think that. I think that's unlikely. It's more likely that Paul received a special revelation from the Lord himself regarding this event, of which we find nowhere in the Old Testament, and more completely here in this passage in the New Testament. So Paul says, we wait on the Lord. He is coming soon. But in the meantime, in the meanwhile, he encourages us to carry on with our service, our ministry, our lives, pursuing holiness. We'll discover next time in 1 Thessalonians 5 that those young believers apparently knew of the day of the Lord, which is judgment. Whenever the term day of the Lord is used in scripture, it always refers to judgment. So it's different from the coming of the Lord. But apparently... Paul had had opportunity, had time enough while he was there, to teach them about the day of the Lord that was forthcoming, but not this preceding event, the coming of Christ for his church, what we call the rapture of the church. That was a new revelation from Paul, as he states here, and then as he makes reference to, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. The only explicit reference in the Gospels to this event is John 14, 1 to 3, in which Jesus tried to assure his disciples the eve of his crucifixion that he was going away, but he was going away to prepare a place for them. And if he would do that, he would come again to receive them unto himself. That's the only reference in the Gospels to this event. So what we have described here is a special revelation to the Apostle Paul that we find nowhere else. And he illuminates it here in Thessalonians, further describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have learned in our study of Revelation last summer that Christ's coming for his church, the rapture described here, and his coming with his church in Revelation 19, Matthew 24, are two distinct events. They're two distinct events, Christ coming for his church and Christ coming with his church. Now, whether his coming for his church is prior again to those years of Revelation 6 through 19 or in the middle of it or at the end of it, just prior to he comes with his church is certainly an event that we can, can disagree on and discuss. But again, we cannot disagree on the fact that he is coming. So verses 13 and 14 give us a preview of the events of the return of Christ for his church new revelation of what had previously been an unrevealed mystery. Now it's revealed with as much as we need to know. Maybe we wish Paul would have been 
more, more descriptive of what this event. Couldn't he have given us an idea of what the timing was going to be like? But he gives what the Lord revealed to him, and it's as much as we need to know, to be faithful and to be ready. The books of First and Second Thessalonians are the letters of those two. Those two letters have been called to be ready by one Bible scholar. That's what Paul is encouraging here, not how it's all going to work out, not the timeline that's all going to be measured out, but to be ready because the Lord is at hand. Remember, if you will, that prophecy is not given to satisfy our curiosity, but to stimulate our commitment. Prophecy is not given to satisfy our curiosity, but to stimulate our commitment to Christ, to his church, and to his commands, that is his word. Or as Jer David Jeremiah has stated, that teaching on, in the New Testament on the return of Christ is not for our speculation, but for our sanctification. That's a reference back to 1 Thessalonians 4, the earlier verses in this chapter, on the pursuit of holiness. So the return of Christ is not for us to speculate about, but for our pursuit of holiness. Or I think it was Warren Wiersbe who wrote that the purpose of Bible prophecy is not to begin a calendar, but to build character. Not to build a calendar, but to build character. So in all of this, we need to remember that it's not given to satisfy all of our questions or to answer all of our questions, but to stimulate our commitment to Christ, his church, and his commandments. Just as the Bible was not given for our information, but it was given to us for our transformation into the likeness of Christ. Certainly in studying God's word, we receive information but we should also be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Well, as Paul describes this event, when a loved one dies, believing in Christ, we need not grieve as those without hope or a false hope that's based on unreliable sources. Paul says, does not, Paul does not say, do not grieve. Certainly we grieve when we lose our family members and our loved ones, but he says, you don't have to grieve as those who have no hope or to grieve because our hope is based on somebody's idea or unreliable sources. As Jesus rose again from the dead, that's our certainty. That's our confidence. The historical fact of Christ's physical, literal, visible, bodily resurrection. So he will bring with him the souls who have died in Christ and he will unite body and soul into one being to share his glory for eternity. And then those who are alive at his coming for his church will be caught up in the air with glorified bodies to meet the Lord in the air. So Paul addresses those who have died believing in Christ and those who are living at the time Christ returns for his church. When a believer in Christ dies today, the soul goes into the presence of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Philippians 1, 22, 23. Physical bodies are buried. Now, if you were able to be with me where I am, we could look out the window here to the graveyard here at Calvary Church. What that graveyard holds is not the souls of those who have died in Christ, merely their bodies. And when Christ returns for his church, the souls will come with him to be resurrected with Christ-like bodies. And the dead in Christ, Paul says, will proceed, will, will be resurrected prior to those who are living. So Thessalonians, he writes, take heart. You need not worry about those who have died in Christ. So those who, whose bodies are in those graves, loved ones we have buried, we need not worry about their souls, they are in the presence of the Lord if they're followers of Jesus. And when the Lord returns, as Paul describes in this event, he will bring with him those souls to be reunited in bodies just like Christ. And those who may still be living, perhaps it will be us. As someone has said, we may be the generation of stewards on duty when the Lord returns. If we are, then we will be 
resur will not be resurrected, we'll be living, but we'll meet the Lord in the air with new and glorified bodies, along with those whose souls and bodies have been reunited by the Lord. It's an incredible event that Paul describes here. An awesome event. But the phases to this incredible event, even though we've rehearsed them already, will include, first of all, Christ's return. And it will include a trumpet blast indicative of God's presence. It will include a command to come forth, such as when Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus in John chapter 11. He went to that graveyard and he said, he shouted out, Lazarus, come forth. That's how it will be when Christ returns for his church. Some have suggested that in that account in John chapter 11, had Jesus not used the name of Lazarus, when he shouted out, come forth, everybody would have come forth. But Lazarus came forth. And that's what will be when the Lord comes for his church, when he issues that shout of command for those who have died in Christ to come forth. So his return, command, and then there'll be the shout of an archangel, perhaps Michael, referred to in Daniel chapter 12. And Daniel chapter 12, by the way, is the only Old Testament reference to a bodily resurrection. They were unaware of that in the Old Testament, did not know of that until the teachings of the New Testament. But it'll be a shout of the archangel, perhaps it'll be Michael. But what a majestic event. And it may be that it'll be heard and seen only by believers. Some believe that it will only be seen and heard by those who have died in Christ, or who believers who are living in Christ when that occurs. The dead in Christ will be raised, bodies raised, united with souls, to be with the Lord in a bodily form. Now only New Testament believers will be resurrected in bodily form, many believe. Non-believers will be raised at the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. Well, they'll stand before the Ancient of Days, as it were, for judgment. Old Testament believers whose souls with the Lord, it's believed, will be raised bodily at the coming of Christ with his church in Revelation chapter 20. But this event, Paul seems to indicate, will refer to the church, those who have lived from the time of Christ till his return. Verse 17, they will meet Christ in the air. They'll be caught up or rapture. The term rapture does not occur anywhere in the New Testament, but it means caught up or snatched away, and that term has caught on, the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, where Paul goes on to explain some of this as well, he describes it will, event, it will occur in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, that quick. Quite a meeting. Quite a meeting it will be. And as old gospel writer wrote years ago, what a day that will be. What a day that will be. And then we'll be with Christ forever. Verse 17. Decay, disease, death that grips us today will have seen its last. And you well know when you turn on the news today, that's all you hear about disease and death. But one day, all of that, decay, disease, the death, that grips us and has gripped our world today will have seen its last. What a picture that will be, and what a day that will be. Paul's concluding thought is one of comfort and encouragement as he closes out what is this fourth chapter. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's what we're to do with that, not argue over the timing of it, but to encourage each other with these words. The Lord's coming will be sudden. It will be unexpected. Any day is possible. No day is impossible. Perhaps today. It was M.R. D. Hahn, who was the founder of the Radio Bible Class in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who the organization still publishes our daily bread today. We have that here at our church, and you may have it at your church if you're listening in from other church settings. It was M.R. D. Hahn, who coined that phrase, perhaps today, perhaps today. 
someone sent me this brief saying, a Christmas card that I've included on your lesson notes. We're no longer looking for the signs of the times. We're listening for the sound of the trumpet. We're no longer looking for the signs of the times. The signs of the times are here. We're living in the signs of the times. We may not be living in the end times. We're living in the last times. May not be living in the final days of history as we know it. But the signs of the times are here. And they are, they are here. And as I said before, there are events taking place today that could well set in stage the events of the end times. Couldn't help but thinking, and maybe you were too, as you drive around today, and especially the last couple of weeks, driving only to what we're supposed to drive to, the grocery store or other places, the roads are empty. A little more traffic today as I tape this session, but the roads were empty, and that's what it will be when that event occurs. No longer looking for the signs of the times, we're listening for the sound of the trumpet. So Paul gives us a special revelation from the Lord that had not been known or recorded previously until he wrote to the Thessalonians that Christ will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, other, in the air. What we call the rapture of the church. What we believe could happen at any time. Christ comes for his church. And then, if you hold to a view that, that this will occur before the years of the tribulation, of Revelation 6 through 19, those will occur. And then Revelation 19, Christ will come with his church, with all the saints, to establish his millennial rule on the earth. Now, if you believe that will happen in, in the, the coming of Christ, as Paul describes here, in the middle of the tribulation, it will happen somewhere there in Revelation 6 through 19. Or at the end, in Revelation 19, when Christ returns with his church, as well as for his church, if you would hold to that view. So again, the timing is not what Paul seeks to emphasize here. What he seeks to emphasize is to reassure hope that the Thessalonians, nor do we, need to be concerned about those who have died in Christ or to be concerned about us who are still living when the Lord returns because he'll reunite souls with bodies for those who have died and he'll change the bodies of those who are living into new and glorified bodies. And that's what he seeks to emphasize and then to encourage one another with these words. So we can use these words as encouragement today in the midst of all this pandemic, when many people are, are anxious, when they're concerned, we can use these words of hope from the scriptures. It was Corey Ten Boom who hid Jewish believers during World War II that penned this in her book that she entitled Tramp for the Lord. I'm not afraid when I think about the coming of the Lord Jesus. Instead, I welcome it. I do not know whether it would be better for me to die and be among the great hosts of saints who will return with him, or whether it would be better to remain and listen for the sound of the trumpet. Either way, I like the words of the song she writes that says, God is working his purpose out. As year succeeds to year, God is working his purpose out. And the time is drawing near. Nearer and nearer draws the time. The time that shall surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as water covers the sea. So I hope these words from the Apostle Paul can be words of encouragement to us as well. That the Lord's coming is at hand. He's coming soon. Let's be ready. Let's be pursuing holiness and purity. Let's be about the business of the Lord. So that if we are the generation of stewards on duty when the Lord returns, we'll be ready when he does so. Let's pray. Lord, as we face the duties and the drudgeries, even the delights of each day, we thank you that we can do so in the light of the preview, the promise, and the picture of your return to this earth as these verses of scripture record for us. Any day is possible. No day is impossible. May we be certain that by faith in you, 
We are ready for that day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Next time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The last of the chapters of 1 Thessalonians. Be prepared. The day of the Lord is coming. It's another phase to what Paul describes here in chapter 4. Thank you for joining us. Hope you can do so next time as well.